Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for taking time out to join us for the third in our series of uh, agronomic uh, uh, knowledge, uh, nurturing the seedling through growth and reproduction. Um, for those of you that don't know, um, I'll, I'll introduce myself. I'm Rob Mann. I'm Vice President of Business and Market Development at Taurus. Uh, Taurus has been around for 19 years and one of the foundations of Taurus for those 19 years has been agronomy and teaching agronomy and um, taking everything back to agro agronomy. So that being the case, we're extremely excited to have Mike Dolinsky join our group as Director of Science Innovation. Mike has uh, uh, been around the ag industry in Western Canada for, for a whole bunch of years and he is a passionate scientist who challenges uh, most of the norms that come out. And so, Mike, um, this is all yours. You bet. Thanks, Rob. And welcome, everybody. Uh, this is uh, the third in our series this year and uh, the last one for springtime because uh, everybody's going to be pretty busy. But our, our plans are that come fall time, we have, uh, oh, maybe 10 or 15 to prepare for next year, uh, covering uh, basically uh, everything from soup to nuts, uh, all the way from nodulation uh, through to what we're gonna be talking about today. Uh, that's gonna be my plan going forward. For today though, uh, we're gonna be talking about, uh, you know, the remaining stages uh, of growth in wheat. Uh, as our model. I'll talk about a few other crops like canola and soybeans from here and there and peas uh, just to show you what's going on with those and next year I'll, I'll put together specific presentations for peas and soybeans and canola but wheat has been studied for a long long time. The first part of this session of this two-part series we covered uh, ripening and senescence because we looked at how the mother plant prepares the seed for germination then we looked at germination leaf development up until tillering and now we're going to take a look at the really uh, from my point of view the important part in terms of setting up your crop for it's uh, maximizing your yield potential because this is where the the real uh, you know uh, meat uh, is learned and produced we look at stem elongation and that's a massive amount of, of nutrient required booting heading in wheat, flowering and anthesis, and development of the fruit. So uh, that's what we're going to cover. But first, we're going to take a look at going into springtime, and, and many of you people are, are going to be going out in the field. And I want to just cover a few things that may help you identify and understand what's going on with your crop uh, going forward. Uh, they're sort of basic principles, and I haven't got a lot of time to cover them, so I'm going to do them fairly quickly. But I think it'll be beneficial. Probably take half of this presentation time to cover this, and the remaining part will be a series of photographs showing exactly how plants pollinate and then finalize uh, productivity. The first thing to remember is that uh, a plant is always in a struggle between supplying nutrients to the source, which is uh, in a plant, the leaves, or in a, in a potato, the tuber, when you put in that seedling or any seed. The seed is the source for a while, and then the leaves becomes the source of nutrients for that plant. The sink is really what needs the nutrient that is produced in photosynthesis from the source, and those are the roots, because roots can't feed themselves. They have no photosynthetic capability. Uh, then we get to the, the formation of the seeds, for example, which uh, in this particular case, I show corn. And we, we have canola growing there, and of course some soybeans that are growing here. These become the sink uh, at the end of the day. So there's always this struggle between the source and the sink. For example, if the roots are running into difficulties, getting drier, it's running it into compaction and can't access water and nutrients, the source, which are the leaves, then have to move all those photosynthates down into the roots in order for the roots to actually penetrate and secure nutrients in water. And plants are made to feed by roots. And the roots are primarily in the top 10 inches of the soil surface. Anything much deeper than that is generally going after water. 
because as you move deeper into the soil profile, there's less oxygen, usually less nutrient, and it's water that they're after. And that's important because for roots to go down really, really deep, it takes a lot of nutrient from the source. So you don't really want your plants to go down deep, but they will go down for water. So you always have that struggle, and that's something to think about. If you see problems in the leaves, you always want to take a look at the roots. If you see problems in the roots, you want to take a look at the leaves, and you want to take a look at how the two are linking with each other. And most of that communication is done with hormones. So here's the typical curve in terms of wheat or any kind of a, of a crop, other than you know with canola, we don't have a jointing period in canola, of course, and we don't have it, or sorry, we, have, we don't have a heading period and we don't have a tillering period. So it's a little bit different, but basically not much difference in terms of the growth curve. And you take a look at, we just finished tillering last uh, session. We're gonna take a look at this massive, massive build up until flowering. That's the critical time where things change. In this case, you can see that we're getting a lot of N uptake and we're getting a huge buildup in biomass. The biomass is dependent on building a lot of cells and then expanding those cells. And I'll talk just a hair about that in just a second. But if we take a look at this, which is the green area index kind of curve in terms of leaf development up until this point, which is typically when we get pollination. It is this growth curve that is critical and stresses under that period really influence the end result in your filling of your grain. At this point in time, you get a, a virtual change from the vegetative growth curve in which the reproductive parts are all being developed, all the seeds are being developed, all the anthers and pollen is being developed, and any stresses along that curve lead to a reduction in pollination. At this point in time, now the seed becomes the sink, the amount of nutrient going down to the roots is decreased, and eventually the plant will pull all the nutrients or as much as it can from the leaves, the stems and the roots and put it into the seed to fill it. So that's our critical point in time. You've got to build it after which we get uh, you know, a, a reduction. As you can see here, we get a flattening of the curve and the nutrient uptake. Once we get that pollination, which is right here, the roots stop pulling nutrients into the plant. You can see here with lentils, that continues a little longer. We take a look at phosphorus and we can see that same kind of bump going on here. And then we get nutrients moving from the plant up into the seeds and it just redistributed uh, as well as some taken up from the roots. There's always enough taken up from the roots until it can't. When the plant can't take anything else from the, uh, during the, uh, from the roots, it supplements it with, with the mobile nutrients that can be taken out of the lower leaves moved up into the seed head, which is now the sink, and that's how we fill that plant. The key thing through the whole process is water. And I'm a firm believer that uh, the development of soil moisture probes and, and uh, uh, the ability to measure water accurately uh, using something like crop intelligence, I think is gonna change everything we do in Western Canada under our dry land conditions. And we'll know exactly where we are in terms of water supply because we need water to drive everything up till here, till heading, and then we need water for the first period after heading, in wheat especially, after heading, in order to fill the seed, and we'll show you exactly how that happens. So from a physiological or molecular point of view, everything rides on photosynthesis, and we take CO2 from the air and water, which is key, and uh, I'm gonna, show you a few slides on photosynthesis, but out of that we get sugars, which then allow the plant to respire at night, for example, in the, or in the roots where, where the plant has to use these photosynthates, these sugars, all the time in every cell to respire because they can't produce any of their own energy. And that's why so much sugar moves to the rooting zone and in fact is pumped out into the rhizosphere in order to feed microbes and many of the kind of uh, organic acids that the roots can pump into the soil. So 30, 40% of those sugars can go into the rooting zone. From the sugars, we get amino acids that are developed, which form nucleic acids, chlorophyll, and so on. We get biosynthesis of all the proteins. We get carbohydrates produced, which, which then form lignans, 
cellulose, and we get some lipids out of that. We then have transpiration, which moves, helps move all of this around to translocation from the leaves uh, uh, to the roots and then through the whole system. But it all depends on photosynthesis. I'm kind of a believer that a farmer's role and an agronomist's role is to manage photosynthesis. And the plant knows how to do all the rest of this on its own and to reduce stress. You do those two things and our yields are gonna go up substantially. Along with the water though, we need all of these nutrients. We get our carbon from CO2, our hydrogen from water, our oxygen, either in the soil from the, from the, from the air in the soil. That's why plants die when the soil is waterlogged because they don't get any oxygen into the rooting zone. Uh, and that's why they, they actually die. They don't sort of drown, they're just like human beings without, we can't get oxygen and water. Uh, oxygen moves through the pores in the soil and that's why compaction is, is not very good for crops because then the oxygen can't move through those pores and get to the roots very well. Uh, a couple of things to point out here that I, uh, I wanna identify is the most, uh, the nutrient that most um, volume in the plant is nitrogen, followed by potassium. A lot of people would guess it's phosphorus, but not even then. Then it's followed by calcium. Then it's followed by phosphorus. Uh, and I'm sort of a believer that you put your N, P, K, and S and build the cells with the N and the P and the sulfur for the amino acids and the rest of the nucleic acid. And then you, you need potassium to pressurize the whole system, to control the water flow through management of the stomata. And you have the hormones that are regulating how this whole plant is working. Many of these micronutrients like nickel, molybdenum, copper, zinc, and manganese, and iron are metals. They're primarily catalysts. They have roles in terms of enzyme activity and they change valences. So they're used in electron transport in both photosynthesis and in respiration, which is primarily carried out in the mitochondria. So it takes water and all of these nutrients and the plant has everything it needs basically to make it go. And it, I just wanna point out a couple of things when you're in the field, take a look at peas, soybeans, canola, spring wheat. They all have different demands for nutrients. You can see that demand for protein or for nit nitrogen is really high in soybeans. So is it in peas. So is in canola, not so much in wheat. Why is that? Protein levels are much higher. Whenever you have a higher proteins, you have higher end demands. Potassium, look at the demand for potassium in soybeans, tremendous demand, but there's a high demand for potassium. And that's why it's number two after nitrogen, about you know, not quite as much nitrogen is used as potassium by about you know, 75, 80% as much potassium is required as nitrogen and potassium and nitrogen are linked at the hip. Sulfur, calcium, lots of calcium used by canola, by soybeans, tremendous amount. Uh, magnesium is needed for photosynthesis, zinc. And you can see here for you guys in Southern Saskatchewan, which are zinc deficient, uh, peas need a lot more zinc than any of our other crops, but so does canola. And lastly, uh, you know, uh, one for you soybean growers, uh, you'll notice that soybean uses a lot more manganese than any of the other crops we grow. And there's a good reason for that. And that is uh, soybeans handle their uh, fixed nitrogen produced in the nodules different than all of our other legumes. And as a consequence, they need a lot more manganese to do that. That's well known. And lastly, I want to just point out uh, two things. Number one is copper. We always hear about copper required in spring wheat. And you can see we need just as much, almost just as much copper in spring wheat as we do in canola per bushel. And yet we never see a deficiency in the plant in, in uh, canola basically. And we see lots of deficiency in wheat. Why is that? Canola is just an amazing plant at being able to scavenge metals and phosphorus and everything out of the soil because of the acids they extract, the root hair lengths, and the way that they manage their roots. And I guess the last thing I would point out here in terms of a boron, which is, a, is always an issue, especially when it gets dry because it's mobile in the soil. You can see that canola and soybeans use a lot more boron than peas and wheat. Basically, dicots 
generally will use more boron in their plant in terms of forming uh, cells, uh, cell walls with calcium and a whole bunch of other stuff, but primarily boron is used in cell wall structuring uh, in plants. And here's a summary of it all. Here's what we're doing. We're trying to get roots dominant. We're then trying to get shoots that are going to be growing well, and we're getting, using optimal plant densities to kind of get that so we can use CO2 and cover the ground and, and produce this massive uh, leaf area index so that we can capture sunlight. We use the four R's to balance nutrition, and then we balance the mobile nutrients in the soil and nitrogen, sulfur, chloride, and boron, and probably molybdenum, and the immobile or not so immobile nutrients along with all those. And that's what it's all about. In the plant though, to, we must remember this, that when a plant becomes deficient, uh, it depends in what it becomes deficient as to whether it can manage it. For example, if we're deficient in nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, or magnesium somewhere in the plant, and the plant can't get those nutrients by the root system, It'll move it from the lower leaves and destroy those uh, cells in the lower leaves and move it. These nutrients do not move very well if the plant is deficient. And as a result, you have to have a continuous supply of this nutrient because the plant can't re, uh, reallocate it nearly as easily. Some of these move a lot better than others. Uh, and you know that's another session all by itself. And these are totally immobile, basically manganese and calcium Calcium is tied up in the cell walls and so is boron. So you need to have uh, these nutrients coming in all the time. And when it gets dry, everything has trouble moving. So we can have short-term deficiencies, even though our soil test will show that we got plenty of boron, we got plenty of manganese, we can have short-term deficiencies either when it's too dry or even when it's too wet because manganese will change its valence uh, when it's too wet. And as a consequence, the plant can't utilize the manganese. So you can have a deficiency for a short period of time under a certain set of conditions in either the environment or the soil, you know, largely for us drought or too much, too much moisture. But as soon as conditions change and the roots get going, that deficiency can disappear if the soil has some nutrient there. So you're going to want to always look at the soil test and the tissue test if you really want to get a handle on what's going on. We are now moving into an era where we have resin balls, we got resin sticks, we have some instrumentation which will be coming on the market that will allow you to do uh, soil nutrient testing right on the farm. And I think folks that are in soil testing and tissue testing are really guessing at what their nutrient situation is within the plant in the growing season. Because just because the soil test says there's lots of P, lots of K, lots of anything, copper, doesn't mean the plant can get it and the only way you're going to know is tissue testing and I'm a real keen believer in tissue testing. We're going to take a close look at the cell because that's really where all the action is and next year I'm going to do a whole hour on just how the cell operates because uh, uh, I'm including it here because I think it's uh, important that everybody sort of uh, try to understand this. You can see that in this particular cell We've got mitochondria right here, which is where we get respiration and we get electron transport here. We get the production of the sugars and ATP here, and we get ATP produced here. Those are the only two places, a little bit, a little bit somewhere else, but basically mitochondria in respiration, and we get uh, ATP produced here. So we always need phosphorus, and we need magnesium because most of the ATP is in fact uh, stimulated by magnesium and is quite frequently referred to as magnesium ATP. About 75% of the ATP is linked to magnesium. We have the, the nucleus here, we have the vacuole over here. And I'm just gonna briefly show you, and we have boron, magnesium, calcium, uh, phosphorus, nitrogen in the cell walls. Uh, I want to just go over here and show you how the how a plant works because I'm going to talk about it and and uh, you just need to sort of I think understand how a plant works. When a plant runs into a deficiency, we have the the each cell is covered by this blue dot called the plasma membrane. And the plasma membrane is coated on both sides by phosphorus and a lipid in between. And what the plant does is when it's short of something or it's stressed, it goes to its nucleus. Uh, it, it 
finds the gene that will upregulate to solve that problem, whether that be heat, drought, whatever, if it needs to get water. It makes a copy of the gene that's responsible, takes it down here and makes a pile of copies of it as uh, messenger RNA, takes it and moves it here and plugs it into the cell wall, whether it's in the root or the shoot or in the root hair. And to do that, it has access to all the photosynthates from the chloroplast. It has access to all the nutrients that the plant stores here in the vacuole. You can see they're all connected to the, the river that I, I call the endoplasmic reticulum, the river that runs through the cell. But it also runs through to the next cell, through these little portals called plasma desmata. And the plant can actually take small bits of micro, uh, micro RNA and move them from cell to cell to cell and get a systemic reaction in response to, say, a disease attack, which will produce a, a bunch of hormones to try and block that disease. So the plant has the capability to move hormones, to move nutrients, to move micro DNA, uh, micro RNA, I mean, from cell to cell to cell. So that's how the cell works. Now, when a plant gets too much of something, say, let's say it gets too much phosphorus, it takes it and stores it in the vacuole. And I show you that vacuole in the cell. And you can see it's got all these transporters. These are all proteins. That's why you need all that nitrogen and phosphorus to make all these proteins. It stores it in there and it stores toxic stuff. Like zinc is toxic to the plant, so it has to protect it. So it puts it into the vacuole. And then as it needs it, it moves it into the cytoplasm and it uses it. And you can see the cell uh, plasma membrane has all these portals in it. And in fact, it has the capability, depending on how serious the deficiency might be or the situation, to have what are called high affinity transports, which it upregulates when things are really tough, and low affinity transport system lats, low affinity transport systems, when there's lots of it. For example, when a root hits a sideband, or a mineral band, there's lots of nutrient there. So it doesn't have to use a lot of ATP to get it. But if it's really hard to get, it's got to produce a whole bunch of extra uh, proteins and transporters, then it can use other genes. Cool stuff, cool stuff. And then it takes and puts those transporters into the root, and specific transfers are there for basically every different nutrient. And then when we look at how the actual cells grow, there's two kinds of growth. There's what's called diffuse growth, and I'll show you a shot of that, where uh, the cell, well, let me go back a second. When a cell is born in founder cells at the apical meristem, it's tiny, so it's got to grow. And as it grows, it has to expand. And uh, plants grow upward, so these cells are made to grow upward by how they're, made, uh, how they're produced. The other type of cell growth is called tip growth. And there's two places that tip growth occurs in a plant. One is in the root hair as a single cell. The other one is the pollen tube, which is also a single cell. And the reason I bring it up here is because I'm gonna be talking about pollination and the actual pollen tube. So you understand that the pollen tube grows by, by what's called cytoplasmic streaming. In other words, the nutrients are moved from the vacuole and from the plant and, and the tip is where the, the nutrients concentrate, and I'll show you exactly how that happens. Here's, here's, for example, you can see that these cells here in the stem, because the stem grows vertically, the cells elongate vertically in the, in, in the, uh, in the stem. And that is produced largely for that expansion, and osmotic pressure is controlled by potassium and water. Uh, in the roots, Boron is also key because boron is involved in the structural cement of the cell wall in all cells, including the, the, uh, uh, the, the pollen tube. I lost my train of thought for a sec. Here's just uh, quickly what, how a plant grows. We have an apical meristem, which is growing and going through the soil and measuring everything that comes in contact. We have uh, uh, that's a root meristem here. And here we have an apical meristem where all the new tissues are formed, all the leaves, all the reproductive parts. And when we, we have the plant picking up nutrients through the roots, moving it up into the leaf in the, in the xylem, running it through photosynthesis in combination with sunlight, gives us sugar, 
gives us uh, CO2 in, kicks out oxygen for us to, and then it moves it into the flow. And the flow moves both ways. The flow can move it up to new growth because this is not photosynthesizing, so the plant has to feed it and it can move it down into the roots to feed the roots and it cycles around. So I just wanna show you quickly that there's a tube system runs right from the root and this is a wheat root. And this is the rhizosphere where it's extracting all of its nutrients and the soil is being held there by root hairs. And the root hairs put out exudates into the root hairs, which control what bacteria and fungi are going to grow in that zone and the plant basically determines that by the exudates it puts into that rooting zone. And the polysaccharides that are produced there are what put the glue to that and keep it attached to the root here. But here we go. So this is soybean, and you can see we get branching coming off so the xylem and phloem can move there. And this is a cross section through the, through the stem, and you can see all the portals here. And this is wheat. You can see xylem here, phloem here, full of uh, material. Here's a cross section through the base of a soybean leaf. And you can see this is the main uh, vein. And these are smaller veins. And this is the xylem on the top and the phloem on the bottom running up through the leaf. This is wheat, basically the same thing in wheat with all the other veins uh, running parallel, of course, compared to soybeans. You can see that these are full of sugar, that the plant is moved in the phloem and it's moving it around. Uh, the xylem and phloem move up and down the veins. You can see that things are moving in there all the way to the tip. The tip is the oldest part of the leaf. So when a plant is both senescing or running out of nutrients and it can move mobile nutrients, it kills the cells and it pulls it in and moves it back into the phloem and out. So typically when you see damage occurring to the tips or along the fringes of the leaves, you better do something about that because the plant is telling you that it's deficient or it's senescing. Early in the growing season, that's deficiency, but once we start filling heads or filling pods or filling yeah, pods basically, then the plant is gonna pull all that nutrient and that tells you that it's, it's, uh, it's starting to senesce. But when that occurs, the plant is killing those cells and it's extracting those mobile nutrients uh, during deficiencies. When the plant is senescing though, and I talked about this last time, it takes everything. The plant has greater capabilities during senescence to move nutrients than it does during deficiency. So when the water that is used to run the whole system gets to the leaf, uh, it has to leave the leaf and it forms uh, a volatile or vapor right here in these spongy meso uh, uh, cells, mesophilled cells, and it leaves here. CO2 comes in, oxygen comes in. You can see here's the vein, there's the xylem on top, the phloem, just like I showed you. So this is on the bottom of the leaf in many cases, and we need to have wind and we have to have lower humidity or else we don't get that transpiration moving through and leaving through the guard cells. And here just is the matter. 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 Oh, what's that? Okay, here are the stomata on the bottom of leaves and you can see that there are little portals in them and these guard cells open and close them. And it's the movement of water that keeps the whole thing going. And when you know you hear Elston say, how many pounds of water does it take to grow a bushel of wheat? And he says 45,000 pounds per bushel. Well, that's why, because hardly any of that water stays, but it keeps the whole process going. Without that, we have a problem. So when the stomata close, and that has to happen, the stomata uh, close, the plant is in, in stress. So the, the plant opens the stomata right here, and that involves potassium, and chloride, potassium is positively charged, chloride is negatively charged, so they balance themselves, and that moves in along with water, and oops, out she comes, the stomata open. When the root is going through the ground, it is measuring water. So when the root finds that it's getting dry, it produces a cystic acid, which it sends up into the leaves, and it triggers the stomata to close. So the chlorine comes out, 
the chloride comes out, the potassium comes out, the water comes out, and the stomata close. And that is controlled uh, largely by potassium in response to abscisic acid. But here's an important thing to remember. The, later on, I'm gonna tell you that plants will pollinate early in the morning. And it's somewhat related to this, I believe. When uh, the plant goes to sleep at night, so to speak, uh, it shuts its stomata. When the sun comes up, the stomata uh, actually have their own uh, chloroplast. What happens is it triggers uh, the increase in potassium. Potassium is the purple line. No, that's sucrose, sorry, the green line. So you can see the potassium rises quickly. The stomata open up very quickly after that. And then the sugar levels start to develop and then taper off. Early in the morning when this is happening is when the plant wants to pollinate because it has to load up the stigma with all those sugars. And I think that's really key to getting good pollination and why water going into pollination, deficiencies of water, really, really hurt pollination, especially in something like canola, which is an open, has an open pistol. So if the tip dries out uh, on the pistol, and I'll show you that later on, then the pollen can't really germinate properly. And I think that's why we get a lot of blasted pods or we get seeds that are lost and boron seems to always be implicated. I wanna just point out here a node. What goes on in a node? Well, first of all, a leaf will come off a node, but, but when we look at it, here's a leaf coming off the node, and you can see the load, node is solid and weak, but it's, the stem is hollow. And, uh, sorry, I'll go back one. So at this node, what can happen is that when water is coming up the xylem, it can transfer into the phloem at the node. There's, there's the ability to move from one to the other through portals in their plasmodesmata and through the tracheal sieve plates and those kinds of things. So there can be movement in there to pressurize the phloem. So that's how we get pressure in the phloem. I just want to point this out for you when you're in the field this summer and you get lodging. When a plant lodges, you have to ask yourself, what kind of lodging have I got? There's two kinds of lodging. And some of you, many of you may know this, but there's stem lodging where the stem actually breaks and the plant falls over, kind of like a, almost like sawfly or hessian fly can cause that. Or there's root lodging. Most of the stuff that I see is root lodging. And I'll explain what, what, how that happens. Uh, I find that when I go and look at lodged fields, you'll notice that it's in a pattern and then right beside it, there'll be standing crop. Uh, when you're in the field next, take your shovel and this will usually be after rain when it lodges, when there's been rain and wind. And you'll find that if you've got root lodging, the plant has just tilted over, but there's no breakage in the stem and the roots have just tilted. In other words, the root was growing near the surface, the soil got soggy, and the roots could not hold up the plant in response to wind, especially with rain. And the plant tilts over, but the roots are still in the ground. And, if you, and, and that is a soil structural problem, not a nutrition problem in the stem. So that's what you want to determine, because if it's, if it's that kind of a thing, you can't fix it with nutrition. You can fix it by changing the soil structure, and you might be able to fix it a little bit if you use something like manipulator to shorten the actual stem, but it's important to determine what caused that. But it's really cool how the plant straightens out. If you look at the node, you'll notice that on the bottom side, the node is bigger and it looks exactly like this. What happens is the plant knows which way is up and it just expands this cell on this side and it just turns it back up. And if, if the root is, is attached and not out of the ground, then you'll still get pretty good productivity out of that. That's just something to impress your, your client if you're a coach uh, about uh, what you know. And here we are uh, in photosynthesis. Uh, we get water coming in, O2 given out. We get some ATP produced to run the uh, Calvin-Benson cycle here, the second part of it. We get CO2 coming in. 
and we get sugar out in the form of glucose. And that's all there is to photosynthesis. But when we kill these cells and we take out the nutrients and we take out this rubisco, which is a protein that about, contains about 30% of all the uh, nitrogen in the cell, uh, that's what happens and that cell is killed. There's also a tremendous amount of magnesium in rubisco and uh, that is the enzyme that is used to take CO2 and convert it into the sugar because that's what the plant wants. And in fact, the microbes in the soil want that carbon from CO2 as well. And that's why they explode in the exudates that the plant puts into the roots, because many of those exudates contain sugar, which is the carbon source fungi and micro needs as well. So they help then once in the soil, they help to extract other nutrients for the plant. And here's just chlorophyll. You can see it's magnesium surrounded by three nitrogen. That's what the plant wants. And if you take a look at these leaves, you can see what I meant. We're getting the, the cells being damaged here, but the veins are kept clean until the end because it, it needs those veins to move out whatever it's going to take and put into the stem and move around in the plants, whether it be down to the roots or up to the seed head or up to new leaves that are developing and not photosynthesizing. You can see the same thing here. In the, in the, uh, in the cell wall of the uh, thylakoids where actually we have uh, photosynthesis take place, a couple of important things to note. First thing that happens in photosystem two is that water is broken in half, the oxygen is given off as a waste product, and the hydrogen is used to pressurize this to form ATP, and this is what runs the ATP protein. But the important thing, and that, that takes manganese and calcium and chloride. Manganese is the catalyst that runs that. And if, if you remember from the last session, when we looked into the seed, the seed resources, manganese was one of those things that was high inside the actual seed of the, uh, produced by the mother plant so that that process can start. Then we again get to electron transport where we get uh, free radicals produce a reactive oxygen species, we have plastocyanin. This is involved in moving those electrons in the central atom and that is copper. Everybody talks about copper, about, you know, it's involved in lignin, it's involved in, in, in uh, responding to ethylene levels, but about 30 to 40% of all the copper is used in this one process in the plant, in all plants. That's why the canola needs it, wheat needs it, soybean needs it, so copper is key in all plants for electron transport. And if you're low on copper, your plant's photosynthesis is gonna be inefficient. The other part here, ferrodoxin, is iron. So all of these metals are used in a large way in zinc in all these reactions in the plant, and then we get ATP produced here, uh, and it's driven by hydrogen levels. And whenever you get a difference in terms of potential across the membrane, you have energy stored. I'm just showing copper and plastocyanin, a bunch of nitrogen and a bunch of sulfur. Sulfur's involved in so many things, you just don't want to be short of sulfur. Stress management. Don't have to tell you, abiotic stress, weather is our biggest problem out here, as well as nutrient deficiency. How does a plant respond? You get all of these stressors on the plant, we get a stress recognition, we get send signal transduction into the nucleus, we get altered cellular metabolism and the plant responds. We have all kinds of genes that respond to stress. We got heat shock genes. We got glutathione upregulating genes. The plant has mechanisms to deal with most of that until it becomes extreme and it can't deal with that. So you might want to take some notes here for a, unless you want to come back and look at this in terms of what are the key nutrients to manage oxidative stress, which is the first kind of stress that the plant usually deals with. And that's caused by all of these types of things, senescence, wounding, herbivores, pathogens, drought. And we get reactive oxygen species here, which are oxygen molecules that are, are damaged during the process of electron transport primarily. So when the stomata shut down and we get oxidative respiration going on, when we get an attack by an organism, we get uh, free radicals or reactive oxygen species 
which the plant generates to attack them. But when we get overstressed, we get too many, and the plant deals with, with them with something called an antioxidant system. And if any of you are sort of foodies, you'll know about antioxidants and how the uh, things like blueberries and blackberries and strawberries and, and lycopene in, in, uh, in tomatoes, all those bright colors are antioxidants. Well, those come from plants. And the plant uses the same thing. It uses glutathione made from sulfur. It uses ascorbic acid, which is vitamin C, tocopherols, to, to which are vitamin E, carotenoids, uh, which are colors. Those scavenge those free radicals. Then it uses enzymatic scavengers, superoxide desmutase, catalases, and so on. And we have a system called the ascorbate glutathione pathway which is responsible for doing some of that along with these other ones. So first thing, you wanna make sure your sulfur levels are good. You wanna make sure, and there are basically three kinds of superoxide uh, desmutases which capture these free radicals. Manganese sods in the mitochondria, iron sods in the chloroplasts, and the copper zinc sods in the chloroplast and, and the cell liquids. So those nutrients, the sulfur, the manganese, the iron, and the copper zinc are the key ones for dealing with oxidative stress. The role of potassium is so great in dealing with stress, you just have to look at everything potassium does. All I can say to you folks, whether you're a farmer, retailer, whatever, we gotta get to realize just how important potassium is to everything that goes on in that plant and you don't ever want to see that plant as best you can short of potassium because it runs just about everything. That's why there's so much of it in the plant next to nitrogen. I won't even go over all of those. I wanna just point out here, uh, uh, there's lots of talk about sulfur because we're short of sulfur. Uh, the lack of, uh, of sulfur coming in from smokestacks and the, re and the massive amounts going out with canola acreages means we're, we're short of glutathione, which is produced in the sulfur sulfate uh, synthesis of, of cysteine, which is the primary amino acid, then it converts some of that to methionine. Glutathione is the first thing that responds to oxidative stress in the plant, and that ascorbate glutathione process is really, really key. I just have these other ones here just to show you that there are transporters in with for potassium, there are transporters for phosphorus, there are transporters for sulfate, and they make up all of these nutrients. Uh, sorry, these, these uh, what would you call them? Uh, these tissues, ATP, lipids, nucleic acid in the cell, and what they don't use, they store in the back. Well, that just reaffirms what I've already said. Lastly, we have the roots that are gonna be growing all through the period we're gonna be talking about, the elongation period through the maturity, and those are going through the ground and they're leaving uh, materials behind as they go. And then we have root hairs following further down the, up the, the uh, root Then we get lateral roots produced. And at the tip, we get this mucilage that is put out. These are called border cells in this per case, case rather mucilage, full of sugars, which feed bacteria and microbes. We get organic acids emitted out the tips to extract nutrients and allow the plant to also slide through the ground. We get lateral roots formed on the main roots, and then we get lateral roots off of those and we get root hairs produced. Those lateral roots feed right into the xylem and the plant is continuing to grow its root system as it grows the shoot system and the two have to be linked together by hormones so they can grow at appropriate times. And we get all that from the soil. And the roots, single cell root hair, as I said earlier, this is growing by root tip, but the nutrients coming in have to pass through these portals called plasmodesmata, or they can go in between the cells, but eventually they hit this barrier called the Casparian strip and they gotta go into a cell to get into the xylem. What this means is that everything, including water is controlled by the cell and anything that is stored has to be stored in these vacuoles and it's prevented from getting in there if it's toxic and it can be kicked out as well. But that's basically controlled right from the root tip up. Now we're just about uh, into talking about uh, pollination and 
plant growth. Here are some roots. You can see they grow at specific angles and root hairs start very early and the shoot moves upward. Canola roots grow more laterally compared to wheat roots. And then in wheat roots, you get, of course, you get crown roots. Here you can see the lateral roots are growing to a, a mid-row band here, and they stay fairly close to the surface, the big roots, and that's why canola is such a great scavenger of immobile nutrients, because most of our immobile nutrients are stratified in the top two or three inches of the soil zone. This just show you where I had urea here, it killed these plants, but these roots were going to it until it got too toxic and it killed the tip off, starts putting out lateral roots there. Here's a shot of, of, of a canola plant extracting nutrients from the crystal green uh, uh, particle. And uh, so we're taking nutrients from those. We can have uh, root hairs burn off, but as long as we don't damage the actual tissue, they'll start growing after it gets by that damage. If you're gonna get damaged, you don't wanna get tip damage, but if you're putting too much urea or boron, and I really don't like boron in, in row as a granule, it's okay as a liquid uh, because the dosage is quite small, but as a granule, those 10% granules can be toxic, but you can see it's burnt off those tips, but the plant doesn't give out. It starts putting out more lateral roots on the existing ones because the roots grow in all directions. So you can have a lot of root damage and your shoot will look fine, but eventually it'll die. And then all those transporters in the root. So that's the basics. And I covered off, uh, oh, a little over half of my time, but the next part will go on fairly, fairly quickly. So we're gonna now go on to elongation. And here's basically how a plant grows. And, and these are all running at different stages. And you can see it goes from 10 to 20 to 30 to 40. And that's kind of like 10 percentage times as different components of the stage grow like booting and heading and flowering but i'm going to show you all those exactly and this is all run basically based on growing degree days with a base of about zero and here if you if you're one of those folks that likes to look at that you can determine at what stage you're going to be if you're measuring growing degree days with wheat you need more spikes more seeds or bigger seeds in that combination to grow a crop so plant seeding density and plant stand and size of head is really, really important. And, um, and I won't go any further. Everybody's got their own opinions about row spacings and planting densities. I like to be in the 32 to 35 plants per square foot range. So that's just me because most guys are underestimating their, their mortality in cereals. The tilling is controlled by genotype, environment, plant density, and nutrition. And you want to sort of get one primary head and one tiller or two tillers at most. If you're getting more than two tillers or if you want to get just a primary head and a tiller, basically up, up, up regulate your, your seeding rate and you delay your nitrogen inputs uh, till a little later once uh, tillering is done. If you go early with too much nitrogen, you'll force tillering. So let's take a look at the stem elongation stage. Uh, once this starts, uh, tillering is basically over. So, uh, you know, and then the intermodes grow to form, form the stem and, and, and the, the height of the plant or the, the height of the, yeah, the height of the plant is, is, is determined by the length of the internodes, not the number of nodes. And I'm going to ask you a question. You think about it and then I'll tell you how many nodes on a stem of spring wheat. You think about that. Three. How many of you got that right? So we're going to take a look at the at this at this plant. So we're starting it with stem elongation. That's for winter wheat. Uh, stage 31, when you would start putting on manipulator between st stage 31 and 32, it means that the the first node is one centimeter above the ground. Now, I have trouble feeling that node. Uh, so the best way to find nodes is to take and dig out a plant or pull it out if you haven't got a shovel, but you should have a shovel, and then split the stem right down to the root. And then you can see the node and you can feel the node. Uh, so we're gonna take a look at these. So stage 32 is the, the uh, node two is at least two centimeter buzz above the ground and, and node three is at least two centimeters above the, the what it, three set, uh, node three at least two centimeters above node two. And all this time we're getting roots growing, both crown roots, and seminal roots 
and eventually we get that, but let's take a look at it. So the spike is below the ground until stage 30. So the head is actually produced below the ground. It grows up fast, it senses the stress in water and nitrogen at this time, and it's already getting kind of late to do a tissue test, get it into the lab and get something on. So you wanna be on the plants at about say, uh, say three, four leaf stage, uh, and you're starting to limit herbicides. Here's the growing point at the tip of the head. Here are the glooms right here. Here's stage 31. First node, and the head is always above the top node because the, the stem elongation takes place from the bottom up. So stage 31, and you can see the seed head, seed head is already there. Stage 31 and a half, it's just one and a half centimeters. Stage 32. We are at this stage already, the seed head is growing. Here are the, the glooms. These are all the primordial parts of the seed. And then we get going to stage 33. This is your third node, and you're three inches above the ground. This keeps on going, and these start elongating. This is the shortest node. This will be the second shortest, and this will be the longest one. And this node from here that holds the head is called the peduncle, and it's the longest node on the plant. So here we go. Tiny, stage two, and there's the seed head, it's gonna be moving into the boot. So when we finish elongation, we have the flag leaf is out, but uh, not flopped over and the, uh, the legule is just visible. And this is the legule, this membrane around the base. So when you're approaching that and the flag leaf is standing up straight, you're getting into the booting stage. So in the booting stage, it, it's pretty fast and not that much happens, but it's critical, critical time because it is forming and growing. That seed head is starting to expand it very, very rapidly. And you get a lot of death here of florets because of shortage of sugar and nutrients. So N at swollen boot for protein production. When the boot is swollen, you can put on extra N and you're going to put enough N on there to hopefully carry the plant through to the end and leave enough N to move into the seeds to get your protein up. If you put on N too much before that, you run the, the risk of growing a lot of uh, extra tissue and not leaving enough N there to get protein up. Um, that's a whole discussion in itself, uh, but you should be, if you're interested in, in protein, you want to be measuring the amount of nitrogen in the flag leaf as the flag, it, once the flag leaf is basically laying flat. And if you get about four and a half percent nitrogen, 4.7 percent nitrogen, at that point in time, you should have enough nitrogen in the plant to get your protein level to 13 and a half percent. The kernel number is also established in that 10 to 30 days before flowering. Again, because of shortage of nutrients. The plant at that point in time is, is in a dilemma because it, it, if it's running short of nutrients, it's not going to have enough to feed the whole family. So it's going to kill off some of those uh, seeds and it'll kill off the ones near the top and near the bottom of the, of the seed head. So here's the flag leaf extending and the boot is going to be here inside this flag leaf sheet. That's where the boot forms. At that point in time, here's the seed. Here's the, the uh, tip of the stigma, and here's the ovule. The anthers are white, and here's the boot. And the boot is swelling, and you can see that the flag leaf is totally closed in, and when this is fully formed, uh, you know we've got the seed head in there. And the seed head at this point in time is pretty big. Uh, if you look inside the floret, you can see here's the, uh, the seed, Here's the, the pistol and it's very tight. So then we get heading and this is the easy part. This takes place fairly quickly and it runs in about 10% uh, sizings, I guess, or, or degrees. And I'll just show you how that is. So here's the, the head starting to emerge when you see the ons are at tips and you can see the legule here is holds that tight, that flag leaf tight around the tip to prevent stuff from getting down into the seed head and contaminating, so that's tight. As the boot grows and expands to emerge, 
it opens it. You can see it's opening here. And we're now at about 52. You can see the legules very nicely laid in there. About this time, you're getting midge can come in. You see the heads are emerged, just emerging. They're still partially in the boot. Once that head is out, wheat midge can come in and start laying eggs on it. So that's your timing for going out and assessing your levels. Fusarium also is involved at that point in time. You're about 40% emergence there, about 50% there. You're about you know, 50, 80% there, poof. Out it comes, and a lot of people say, well, then it, blew, uh, it blooms or pollinates, not so. What happens then, we get continued elongation on the peduncle and it moves the seed head up it, after it comes out of the boot. So here's a sequence of, of shots showing that. Here it's just emerging, emerging, pushing up, pushing up, pushing up, and it moves up about four and a half inches over about three to four days, and then pollination takes place. Now that's under relatively cool, really good growing conditions. If it is extremely hot and it's really dry, I've seen wheat start pollinating right here as soon as it comes out of the head. And uh, the hotter it is, the faster it basically glows. But it takes about four days for the seed head to five days to pollinate all of those, uh, those seeds. So this is the flowering period. It starts with the first anther visible, visible uh, outside of the seed head because wheat is open flowering. In other words, the, the plant kicks the flowers out or the anthers out after it is pollinated. Uh, barley is a closed flowering plant. In other words, uh, barley does not kick out the anthers and it's, it's called a closed flowering head. So here's stage 60 to 69. And here we have uh, a seed. We have the glooms uh, on the plant, two glooms. We have uh, no one gloom on this side, one gloom on that side. There's only two glooms. Then we have uh, the on is on the bottom part called the lemma and the pelia. Here's the seed, here's the stigma, and here are the anthers. And this is what it really looks like. And there's generally four seeds uh, per uh, spikelet and pollination starts in the middle of the head. And each one of those spikelets sits on this node, so it's gotta be fed uh, through this node. And here we go, there's the anther, this is the stigma, and these are called lauticles, and I'll tell you what those are for later. So if you wanna determine when a, a, a floret is gonna pollinate, here's how you do it. You take a look at the color of the anther and the way the uh, stigma is developing. And this series will show you. It's, when it just comes out, it's green. You can see that the, ant, uh, the stigma is very tight. Close up of it, very tight, the, nice and green. As time goes on, the plant loads that stigma with sugar and all kinds of nutrients, massive amounts, because it has to feed the pollen grain when it uh, lands there, continues to expand getting more and more sugars, nice and green. Now it starts to open up and spread. Anthers are a little bit yellowing, lots of sugar on it. Continues to spread, now we're getting quite yellow. Spreads wide open. When you open that floret and look in there, you'll see it spread wide open, yellowing. Lots of sugars on there, and look at that. All of a sudden, the anther starts to open and the pollen grains start to come out. They start being sucked onto the uh, pistil because they're dried out before the plant opens and releases them. So they're just drawn there by, by hydroscopic pressures, I guess. There's all the uh, pollen grains on the, on the stigma. You can see lots of them there, close up there, and there they are. And you can see that the actual stigma has all these little sort of spines on it, so it captures the pollen grains. Now, each one of these pollen grains is going to germinate and move down the pistil, and it only takes one grain to pollinate that seed. And there's probably three to 5,000 grains of pollen produced per each floret, and it only takes one. So once it gets to this stage, if you've got good, healthy pollen, you've got a good, healthy ovule with some decent moisture, you're probably going to get pollination. But if you don't, uh, oh, I'll cover that in a sec. And here's 
uh, the tip of a uh, silk on corn. So you can see it's a grass as well, and it has these little protrusions that also help capture pollen. Once the pollen is is uh, uh, once it's pollinated, the next day. Now the pollination usually will take place in the morning, and then by the next morning it'll extrude that anther. Uh, and like I said, in the morning we're getting the plant starting to move water and nutrients up in response to sunlight. So it really, really puts a lot of sugars and nutrients onto that stigma to feed the anther, or sorry, to feed the pollen grain. And you can see these lodicles here. Well, when a plant uh, is gonna extrude this anther, it has to open it up to let it escape. So these lodicles swell and it just pries open the lemma and pellia enough to allow it to move out and it grows this filament within 20 minutes, usually early in the morning, and it kicks it outside of the, of the floret and it's empty. All the pollen is gone and you can see it's still attached there, but it's still bright and yellow and that's what Fusarium feeds on when it attacks the, the, the stamens. And here we go, or sorry, the anthers, which you know, are the same, same thing. And here we have the filament and it's hanging out. So there's your first one you got out. And by now, it's it's basically all done. You can see these are old ones. These are new ones that are still yellow. During this period of reproduction, you saw all those nutrients that is on the stigma. It increases massively in the pollen tube, auxins and sugars are produced as zinc is involved in making the pollen healthy and to produce auxins. Zinc is key in terms of auxin production. Manganese is also upregulated in there for lignans and photosystem systems because we're trying to get as much photosynthetic material done as possible and we need it to keep that whole photosystem running. Copper is involved in healthy, in healthy pollen and production of pollen. So, uh, and calcium is, is really key in terms of the stigma and pollen tube, and I'll show you those kind of things. So once the pollen grain lands on the stigma, uh, it opens a hole. And inside of there, there's a pollen tube nucleus and the male genetic material. And the pollen tube actually grows the pollen tube out of that hole, down along the stigma, and on the way down, the generative cell splits into two sperm. So here's what's guiding it. This is the calcium gradient level in the tip. There's a high, high concentration in the tip because it's moving all these nutrients in, a, in, a, in cytoplasm, moving it here. And it's the calcium that is building the tip of this and the cell walls in there along with boron. And that gradient is what regulates that. This is just another shot of that, showing all the transporters here for calcium. The red in, is just showing the higher level of calcium here. And here's the vacuole that is supplying those calcium uh, uh, ions as well into the system that have been stored up there. So the calcium is a big gradient that is moving uh, along to regulate the growth of the pollen tube. And that is guided by something called GABA, which is an amino acid that is used to guide that pollen tube in through a micro uh, pile into the ovule. Once it gets there, the pollen tube breaks, one sperm goes to form the germ, the other sperm goes to form the endosperm, and we have a wheat seed. In, in potted plants, it's a little different. Remember I said it only takes one pollen tube to pollinate a, a wheat kernel. Of course, with, with canola, we got you know 30, 30 seeds. So we have to have a pollen grain grow down to every seed. So there's lots of deficiencies there that can occur because canola will bloom over a 30 day, 20 day period, depending on the year. If it's hot for part of that, depending on where pollination is taking place, there can be a bunch of blanks uh, in the seeds because the pollen tube didn't make it, the, the pollen was killed on that day, the tip of the anther didn't have enough sugars there to support growth all the way down. So there can be a lot of things and stresses that affect that. I'll just show you a few other things. This is a pea, and here's the stigma. Here's, here's all your sort of anthers there. And 
this is the same thing happens in peas and then pollen grains grow down pollinate every every uh, seed wheat here are the anthers all the pollen here lands on the tip of the stigma and each one of those pollen grains has to grow down there you can see this one here is is a wow this is rare in hen's teeth this uh, pollen grain actually germinated and you can see the pollen tube right there push the grain up above. And here are all the pollen tubes that are growing down and racing to pollinate and fertilize each one of those seeds in that pod. And that's why when we see blanks in peas or we see blanks in pods of canola, quite frequently it is because that seed, that embryo did not get pollinated. And there can be a lot of reasons for that, but usually it's stress during that period of pollination. And we're down to the last part of it, and that's the fruit development. So I covered this in the last presentation, but I'm going to quickly go through that because it's just kind of cool. So we get the water ripe stage, we get early milk, we get medium milk, and then we get late milk. Here's your florette in the middle, this one, uh, and these two will be about equal in terms of nutrient efficiency and size. This one will be a little bit smaller and this one will be really quite smaller. And every once in a blue moon you'll get a fifth one, but not so serious. And if if you look, if you take a look at uh, at this head, you'll notice that, uh, and I'll show you in the next picture, that if you take uh, seeds from here and you compare them to hit to there, the middle ones are way, way advanced compared to the bottom ones because the pollination starts in the middle. And it continues that way. You can see that this seed uh, is from that, that uh, set of spikelets I showed you. Uh, this seed and this seed are about the same size. This one's a bit smaller and this is smaller and never will catch up to these. Now, if you want to get your last chance to get your protein level up is right after anthesis or pollination. Uh, once you see those anthers out on the pod, or, or I'm sorry, on the seed head in wheat, you have about eight days after that that you can put nitrogen on and a lot of guys will put uh, uh, dissolved urea on uh, because at that point in time in this watery ripe stage the plant has got no dry matter in here it's just moving a lot of nutrient into that seed head in order to start preparing to form the head so this is your last stage to put on uh, nitrogen if you want to touch up your protein and you can move it from about a half to 1%, uh, putting on anywhere from around 20 to 25 pounds of man per acre. But you gotta make sure that the economics are there for that. So after the, uh, the water ripe, you start starting to form the actual uh, endosperm and the germ. And you can see that moves to this stage at the milk stage. And you can already see that the germ is formed the endosperm is formed, but it's in the milk stage. So you get a progression this way through it. By the time it gets to this stage, everything is basically formed and is starting to dry down. And there are your four seeds. These three are probably good for seed. This one you wanna try and get rid of. I would prefer to have these two as my new seeds for next year, because those are gonna be the most nutrient dense. Thank you. I just want to take a quick moment, Mike, if you can go to the next slide and, and revisit the uh, Marsner um, slide. One of the things that we, we do have in our uh, product is, is a couple of products, foliar products, Active Build, which we touched on last time, and Active Flower. Um, those nutrients lo loads inside those two are very closely uh, matching these type of uh, requirements of, of the plant in these different stages. All right, thanks again, everybody. We know that it's a busy time of year and appreciate um, your time on this and hope you found it very useful. Have a nice day.